Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Funding Project's Fiscal Mapping Webinar. My name is Sarai Cook. I'm a citizen of the Muscogee Nation. I'm also a senior fellow with the Children's Funding Project. The Children's Funding Project has been working successfully with state and local governments for several years now. We've been helping them map resources, providing cost models, and providing revenue generating technical assistance. And we've had many successes, um, which we'll go over later in this webinar. We understand that tribal government, governments function differently from state and federal governments. So we're taking these differences into account and hoping to be able to provide resources that are valuable to tribal governments. Our last webinar covered cost modeling. And we had some really great discussions around cost modeling and how cost modeling can be used to measure the true cost of early childhood education. This webinar focuses on fiscal mapping for all ages, cradle to career. And we have some wonderful experts today that will go over some tools that we've created. And we're also still in the process of creating more tools. Here you can see our mission and our services. We provide coaching and tools to maximize federal COVID relief funding. We also provide strategic finance planning, as well as uh, technical assistance on pursuing dedicated public funds for all ages. So next up, we have Jennifer Ratcliffe. Jennifer has agreed to co-sponsor this series with us. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I'll let you introduce yourself, Jennifer. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Ratcliffe. I'm the Executive Director of the National Indian Child Care Association. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and live in our current territory in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I'm super excited to be joining this webinar with the Children's Funding Project. Um, our organization works with tribal child care programs all across the country to provide capacity building support and advocacy to ensure that our tribal needs are met from the federal government perspective. Um, we support relationship building between states and tribes, among tribes themselves, and between tribes and the federal government. Um, we do direct technical assistance and we provide group technical assistance as well. Um, and, you know, working with the Children's Funding Project is just one of the ways that we can help support um, tribal child care programs in being as effective and efficient as they can be in providing services to our children and families. So we appreciate this opportunity to be here today um, and to join the Children's Funding Project in this effort. Um, I want to share that we have our, the last um, webinar in this series is, is on Wednesday, November 2nd. It, the registration is now open, so you can go and um, register for that. The webinar in November will cover ideas for creative funding sources to support programs and services for children and families and provide examples of creating funding, funding strategies that are currently being used across, um, across the Indian country. So we're excited for today's session and excited to see you again in November session. Um, I know Saraya and uh, Saraya and her team have a lot of great information to share, as well as an opportunity to participate in um, a pilot project that the Children's Funding Project is working on. So thank you so much and en enjoy the afternoon. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate you. Next up, we have uh, Alicia Wilson Alstrom. Alicia is a senior fellow with the Children's Funding Project. Alicia will be providing an overview of the federal funding tool. So we're creating this federal funding tool as well as a demonstration tool. And the tool, once it's finished, it will be available on our website. At first we had, um, we had all of the federal funds going to states and tribes and localities. We've since thought it was a better idea to pull out the, the tribal data and just have the um, tribes have their own tool. So that's what we've been working on. So I'll hand it over to Alicia to go over the tool. 
Thanks, Sarai. Uh, again, I want to thank um, everybody for the opportunity uh, this afternoon to uh, share a bit about fiscal mapping and specifically to walk through um, the fiscal mapping tool that we um, have been developing. Um, again, we will have that launched as an interactive and searchable tool on our website later in the fall. Um, I'll also uh, share a little bit about some starting points in thinking about mapping your own fiscal data. Next slide. Again, I wanna start with just um, a level setting on what a fiscal map is. Again, it is a tool for collecting data on funding and tracking who spends how much and on what services and programs. Um, and so that is uh, the essence of what we mean by a fiscal map. And when we apply that to children, youth and families, we are particularly interested in pulling out of all of the resources that are brought to bear with regard to federal resources in this case, to understand what is being invested in children, youth and families specifically. Um, it's a way for us to do some accounting of the money um, and the funding streams uh, behind that money that fund uh, services for uh, children and young people. Um, and a map um, can also be used to drill down further to also add in information about what state and local entities bring to the table and contribute and invest in children, youth, and families as well. Next slide. So what we um, seek to do is to, from all of the different um, agencies that um, have money that support child and youth uh, services is to move uh, that um, out of just kind of the department by department view that we can search for by looking at any uh, uh, government federal agency website and to create ways for people to look at that and begin to analyze it from a more child or community centered view of the budget, the way in which we as communities really talk about um, our aims and goals and outcomes um, and hopes and dreams for children. And so on the right, you'll see um, that we really try to reconstitute um, and put information together in ways where people can see what those investments look like against some of the outcomes the, that communities collectively care about. And some of the reasons why we um, have invested in this particular strategy as part of a set of ways in which to kind of think about um, how money flows, what it's invested in, and what it adds up to, and whether or not uh, uh, the ways in which it adds up really serve our purposes is a couple reasons. One is to support coordination across services and supports that um, may um, require us taking, again, a more child-centered view of the budget to track and to maximize funding opportunities, not just those that come from federal sources, but how those might align with other pots of money that come from different sources. And then in this era of COVID, new emerging reasons uh, really relate to um, determining um, how budgets were affected um, as a baseline and then understanding and planning for ways to more equitably um, align um, and administer distribute resources uh, to support program um, and services and outcomes for young people. So what I'm gonna do is actually share my screen to share with you um, uh, the Excel version of the map that we are working on and uh, walk through uh, the, the tool itself. So again, with this particular tool, um, we are really interested again in collecting a couple different kinds of information. The first uh, set of information, as I said, uh, really relates to just uh, describing the programs themselves. In the case of this federal map, we have mapped um, um, almost 150 different uh, federal funding streams related to, um, to children, youth, and families. In the tribally um, affiliated funding map, uh, you'll note kind of the, uh, the rows that are in white are federal funding streams 
uh, uh, that are available uh, across several entities. Um, and then in yellow, we've highlighted specific funding streams that are specifically um, um, for uh, indigenous populations um, and entities. And so I'm gonna walk through the map itself to just give you a sense of what kinds of information we're collecting um, in the tool. Again, the funding stream names and just a description of the purposes of the fund itself. Tracking the money, um, in this case, going several years back with the appropriate, appropriated amounts by fiscal year um, in, um, in for that particular funding stream. Um, in this case, back from uh, FY19, 20, and 21, and we're adding fiscal year 2022, uh, for which we have complete data as well. Um, and then we have um, the funding level. In this particular map, all of the funding level is federal funding streams, particularly um, because uh, these are all federal sources, but we also work with um, a range of different entities to add to this to create state maps. We have a 15 state cohort um, that is um, adding in their state level data as well, um, as well as some local and regional maps um, to uh, work with local entities as well. We also collect information on who, in this case, the who is the federal um, agency that administers uh, the funds. And we also collect information on who related to where that money um, would land by tribal entity status, which um, kind of um, entity would be um, eligible to receive those funds. Also by um, when and where um, there's a designation of a particular um, one or more particular indigenous groups uh, that would be eligible funds. So you'll see here in those um, funds uh, marked in yellow here, specifically again, um, uh, uh, designated for particular populations. Um, other pieces of data that we collect, um, the one uh, piece of data that we are actually in real time uh, collecting is geographic restrictions on funding. You'll see that that's not populated here. We are trying to do our due diligence to make sure that we also, in the case of tribally affiliated funds, mark any geographic restrictions related to where those funds can be spent um, and, and, and what those, uh, those geographic uh, boundaries might be for funds uh, that do have that kind of uh, limitation on it. Um, and then we collect a bunch of data that help us do some of um, what I said before, trying to not just have a map that reiterates what each agency gives, but to help people understand where that's going at, in a particular community. So in this case, we do a couple of different things. We uh, provide some tags around the local, typical local recipients who specifically in a given area um, might be eligible to either apply directly or to be the end recipient of those funds, whether or not those funds have been designated as COVID relief funds, um, an outcome category for each um, uh, for each of the funds, what is this primary outcome is uh, connected to everything from um, education to health to employ, um, being employed, um, etc. Um, and then from those outcomes, can we also map services and program areas that um, those funds relate to, and even further down to a specific type of program or, or, or fund area, anything from employment and workforce development uh, down to um, foster care um, or special education services or early childhood education services. And then we also map um, where there are funds that are targeted to specific age ranges, which age ranges those are targeted to. And then also if there are any particular eligibility criteria um, for a particular subpopulation of young, um, young people or children. Um, we gather that information um, primarily from several different resources, but our primary resource that we gather it from is usaspending.gov, which is a federal search tool that maps every single dime that the US government spends um, and helps. Um, and we pull just those data that relates to children, youth, and families. So again, 
um, just to show again, this particular search tool. Um, and again, our um, particular map will kind of do some of this homework for you and kind of really um, hone in on children and youth funds for this particular thing. Um, for example, I just um, am showing you the tribal um, maternal infant and early child home visiting programs. But this is just to show that kind of underneath the large federal data um, big picture, you can drill down to um, look at funds that have landed with particular um, uh, tribal entities. So in this case, um, if I were to uh, put in search tools and then further drill down to say um, which entities receive funds within a given uh, fiscal year or given period of time, um, in this case, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians could again see from that large federal level all the way down, drilled down, you can kind of see where funds um, have landed. So I'll stop there, just this overview of the federal fiscal mapping tool, and I'll stick around for questions. Sorry, I think you're muted. Thank you, Shane. So I just want to make it clear for everyone, this is still in process. And so when, once this is finished, it'll look a lot more like the federal tool that we'll be going over later on, right? Okay. So when will this, um, like, what do we have a timeline on when this will be done and on the website for people to use? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Yeah, we have this month actually to um, finish um, um, all of the uh, transfer of information, um, both for the uh, federal tool and uh, specifically kind of the tribal uh, related funds tool um, together and to get that um, and to work with our um, developer to have that up on the website just later, uh, later this fall. Okay, so I think people will get a better idea and understanding of how this tool is going to look and be more user friendly once we go through the next tool that we're going to go through, which is the ARPA tool that is up on our website currently and is uh, extremely user friendly. And so once um, this tool is fully developed and on our website, it'll look a lot more like that. So just let's keep that in mind and then we'll go back and answer questions at the end. Thank you. So next we have Nat Mud Brooks. Nat is a research assistant. Nat has been working on a visual to demonstrate how federal funding flows to tribes for children and youth programs. So I'll let Nat introduce yourself and talk a little bit more about your project. Awesome, thanks Sarai, appreciate it. Um, so as Sarai mentioned, my name is Nat and I am working with Children's Funding Projects partner, the Community Innovation and Action Center, which is housed at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. And I work there as a research assistant. And so part of my role was creating a federal fiscal map that shows how money is ending up into tribal communities and supporting various children's programs. And so this tool is great for understanding how that money is starting in a federal department and then all the, the pathways that it takes to end up into tribes, schools, programs, organizations, that sort of thing. Um, and so I'll go through how this tool is useful for tribes and then I'll walk through a couple different examples of um, the breakdown of departments and, um, and that'll be it. Um, so just to start, like I said, I'll go through. Um, Next go slide. Or Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first way that this might be useful for, for tribes is just understanding this, the various pathways that this money is taking. We'll see that the money takes several stops along the way before it funds the various programs. Um, and then secondly, just understanding what specific programs are being funded and then also comparing that to non-tribal funds as well, because this tool includes tribal funds and non-tribal funds. And then lastly, understanding the role of tribal offices at the federal level. I think this is important to note because that way we can get a better understanding of who's at the table, who isn't, and then who's making those decisions on how much money is getting appropriated and to whom. 
Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so just for some context, using the tool that Alicia was talking about, that big spreadsheet is what I use to create this um, fiscal map. And so um, just starting with the legend, it just breaks down what the different colors mean. And um, we'll look at a few different examples on the next few slides. Uh, so starting with the U.S. Department is going to be at the heart of each smaller map. So things like U.S. Department of Education, um, Treasury, um, Health and Human Services, those large departments are going to be where the funds are originating and then getting further appropriated from there. So then the subsequent boxes are going to be our administrations and offices, both at the federal level. Um, and then from there, the money is ending up into tribal communities and states um, and um, ending up to fund those pro those children programs. And so we wanted to make a special distinguish, uh, specifically distinguish between tribal funds and non-tribal funds. So again, we can compare what programs are being funded uh, across the board and what's different, what's the same, that sort of thing. And then on the right, you can see those little sticky notes and those will tell us what the children's programs are, whether they're tribal, non-tribal, and because I used fiscal year 2021 data, it was important that we could include those COVID relief funds as well. So you'll see those with the red sticky notes. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll see a breakdown um, with the U.S. Department of Education. And so I highlighted this little section so we could get a better idea of the role that a tribal office at the federal level is playing in appropriating funds. And so like I said, U.S. Department of Education is where funds are originating, and from there, that money is getting uh, into the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, and then getting further appropriated to the Office of Indian Education, where then executive decisions are being made on how much to which school, to which organization that is tribal affiliated. And so, again, just like making the distinguishment between um, the role of um, uh, tribal federal offices are making. And then on the next slide, we'll see a different example of um, the route that money takes when it doesn't go through a federal tribal office. So now looking at the Department of Health and Human Services, I highlighted a couple different examples. The first one being um, highlighting the section with the Children's Bureau. You can see that there isn't a tribal office here. And so Children's Bureau is make, the one making the executive decisions on how much to appropriate to tribes and tribal organizations. And so just a different example of who's at the table, who isn't at the table. And then at the bottom, um, this one was similarly structured to that portion of the U.S. Department of Education, and we can see that there are two different um, tribal federal offices that are making decisions on how much money is getting appropriated to different tribal organizations, that sort of thing. Um, and so we'll send out a link to this fiscal map and feel free to play around with it. I used this software called Miro. It's pretty easy to use and um, was helpful in creating a visual tool like this. And um, yes, thank you for sending that link out. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nat. So next we have Kylie Wheeler. Uh, Kylie is a research and policy manager with the Children's Funding Project. Kylie designed and continues to update the children funding, Children's Funding Project's American Rescue Plan database. This database is available on our website. Kylie will introduce herself and talk a little bit more about the tool. And just to remind you, this is it's not going to look exactly like this, but when our federal funding tool and tribal federal funding tool is finished, we're hoping that it'll look a lot like the, this database and be very user friendly. Thanks so, so much, Sarai and Nat. I muted myself. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I was muted when I said thanks to um, Alicia and, and Nat for sharing their insights. I'm so excited 
about all of the tools um, that are that are in process right now. Um, and that I just learned a lot just from from your preview. So, um, so hi, I, I'm Kylie Wheeler. Like Sarai said, um, I'm Applied Research and Policy Manager uh, at Children's Funding Project. And uh, since about March 2020, um, I have been leading the uh, research analysis and resource development around federal COVID relief funding um, and how states and communities uh, can uh, leverage those funds uh, on behalf of children and youth um, in, in creative ways. And um, I think our most exciting uh, resource thus far um, is our ARPA funding database uh, or our American Rescue Plan funding database, which I believe is gonna be linked in the chat here. Um, and that's really what I'm here to talk about today. Um, so, and I'm gonna share my screen in a moment and, and walk through the tool itself. Um, but first, I just wanted to say a bit about uh, why we are especially excited to share this tool today, even though it's been up and going for um, a little over a year now. Um, so today we are unveiling, making public um, the addition of over 22, well, just about $22 billion um, in funding, COVID relief funding um, tracked across 853 tribes um, and tribally affiliated organizations um, uh, and across about 10 different uh, American Rescue Plan funding streams. Um, and I am really looking forward to walking you through um, these new sections, uh, but also talking a little bit about uh, like the three primary ways that uh, child and youth advocates uh, can use this tool um, as a whole to support your strategic public financing efforts for children and youth and especially uh, native children and youth. Um, and, you know, I, as, a, as a side note, um, you know, we are, you know, a year and a half out from the passage of the American Rescue Plan, I think that's right, and we are approaching um, we're approaching some deadlines for spending or obligations. So um, it, it may feel like, uh, you know, the American Rescue Plan funding isn't, you know, it, there's not still opportunity there or, um, you know, you know, we, we're out of time to use those funds. Um, and while that may be true in some, in some places and in some situations, there are still, uh, there are still opportunities. But I think more so uh, we have the opportunity to consider and, and look at the ways folks across the country have used these funds um, and how we can follow that model, maybe not necessarily with American Rescue Plan funds, um, but as we as we get new funding opportunities in the future. Um, so thanks for thanks for listening to that little intro. Um, <laughs> So uh, just a, a preview of the three primary ways that this tool um, can help you uh, drive those sustainable funding strategies in the near and midterm. Um, so first, it's going to help you understand the, the funding landscape uh, pretty simply. Uh, you can find uh, some strategic inspiration um, in one section that I'll, I'll show you in just a moment um, where we are tracking the ways that um, a variety of, of governments and actors and entities across the country have used these funds uh, creatively for children. Um, and then finally, uh, you can use it to advocate for more sustainable funding. Um, so I will, without further ado, share my screen. Um, yes, that's fine. Okay. All right. So this is what it looks like on our website. I am going to um, switch over for a slightly bigger view. Um, so this is the homepage um, of, our, of our database. And I will say the original intention uh, was really um, to kind of twofold, to keep a record of, you know, the, you know, 
billions of dollars that the American Rescue Plan brought uh, both in flexible funding and in funding for children and youth. Um, but also, and especially, you know, a, a, you know, six months ago, uh, it has served as, as an advocacy tool um, to help folks really understand what funding is even coming down in the first place. Um, so I'm not going to go through every page of the tool because I really want to focus um, on these on these um, new additions of our tribal data. Um, but just high level, uh, we have a funding overview for states and territories. Um, we'll get to our examples database in just a minute. Um, and then we have highlighted um, in these other tabs here uh, certain funding streams that are either American Rescue Plan funding streams that are either uh, inherently, you know, child and youth focused um, and or very flexible. Um, so that they presented some sort of opportunity. But I'm going to jump right in uh, to the funding overview uh, for tribes um, and just say a little bit, let's see, I'm going to fit this to the page, uh, say a little bit about what this is and how you can navigate it. So this page um, really collects all of the all of the funding of, across funding streams across um, recipient types that went or is going to either a tribal government or uh, a tribally affiliated affiliated organization. Um, so the first place to go if you are looking for a specific tribal entity, um, you can uh, go right here um, and you can either search um, or scroll through um, and find the one you're looking for. I am going to look for um, the Navajo Nation. I'm going to scroll down just to give you a sense of kind of the, it's a long list. Um, one second, all right. So once you make your selection, uh, you will see that the table is going to condense itself um, and you're gonna have a little funding summary uh, down in the bottom left here that uh, brings together, like we can see, um, and this, this makes sense that, uh, you know, the direct relief uh, to the Navajo Nation in Arizona, New Mexico and Utah uh, makes up the bulk of the American Rescue Plan funding. Um, so that's one way to go about it. And I should also note, um, if you click this little plus sign here, you can see directly, um, and I think a little more clearly, uh, the specific American Rescue Plan funding streams and their amounts and, and how they contribute to that 2.2 billion um, total. So that's one way. And if you're interested in um, the funding that came to tribes uh, within the geographic boundaries of your state. Um, we also um, have this, this filter. So if we look at Arizona, um, you're going to see, OK, who received money? And then if we click here, what kind of money did they receive? Um, and again, this is just within the geographic boundaries. Um, we understand that uh, you know, like in the case of the Navajo Nation, you, these funds may be used outside of those geographic boundaries, um, and they do not stand in them. It's more of a it's more of a way to just organize, um, especially for people who are, uh, you know, trying to become more familiar with uh, the tribes in their state that are located within the geographic boundaries of their state. Okay. So the other tribally focused page um, focuses uh, just explicitly on the tribal fiscal recovery fund allocations from the American Rescue Plan's state and local fiscal recovery fund. Um, and these are funds that uh, have a wide range of eligible uses. Um, and we've seen some really amazing examples of how these funds have been used uh, for equitable recovery for children and youth um, across the country. Um, and given that, you know, we're tracking $22 billion, but 20 billion of it 
uh, is fiscal recovery funding, uh, we wanted to pull these out and, um, you know, have a have a clear a clear view. Um, and just quickly, uh, you know, we have the same for cities, counties, and uh, towns across the country. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we included um, that we that we separately identified the allocations that went to tribes in the way that we do for states. Um, so making that note, and I'm just going to scroll through here. Um, we uh, do track education funding um, and we uh, do designate where uh, schools that are explicitly tribally affiliated um, throughout. Um, and that's also included in the tribal funding overview page. The same for uh, tribally controlled colleges and universities um, here in our higher education emergency relief fund uh, page. And then finally, um, if you'd like to see all of the funding that we've tracked um, across the country, uh, both the tribal funding and all of the rest, you can come here. Um, you can filter by state or territory. You can filter by recipient name, um, which is the way to do it if you are looking for a particular for a particular tribe. Um, and this is a great place to get uh, kind of a bird's eye view of um, either the particular types of funding you're interested in or the particular geographic region um, that you're interested in. Um, so I, I feel like I sped a little bit through that, um, but happy to answer any questions once, the, uh, once we get to that point in, the, in our time together. Um, and I'm gonna use my last couple of minutes uh, just to highlight, I think our favorite page, honestly. Um, this is where we are uh, tracking the creative, um, bold ways that states and communities and tribes across the country are, are or have, are using or have used uh, these funds. Um, and if you scroll through here, and I may have already, let's see. So in this table, uh, you can see that we're tracking um, location, of course, uh, the project investment, a description of um, the project at hand, the age groups that the funded project uh, focuses on, as well as the focus area. Um, and you see, and you can filter by state or territory. You can also filter by recipient type. Um, so if we Collect tribal entities here. Um, you can see that we have one, two, three, four, um, four examples uh, that are that are tribally related in the tool. Now we really want to grow um, this this piece of our database. So, and I meant to say this at the beginning. You know, this is literally the first day that we have launched. Um, this new part of our tool. And we want to approach this. Um, we're excited to show you this, but we are also looking at this as a learning opportunity and an opportunity for feedback. Um, and that one type of feedback that we're interested in is, you know, why isn't this great example highlighted here? Um, you know, we want to include those. So, um, have my you'll have my information after this if, if you want to reach out and give those excuse me give those uh pieces of feedback um but yeah i think that's where all that's where i'll close it up we are we are looking to looking to grow particularly this part of our database because you know we have great examples if you look through these descriptions we have fantastic examples of strategies um, that places have used to affect real change and promote equity um, for kids and their families. And 
those strategies are not unique to the American Rescue Plan funding. Um, you know, those are, in, in most cases, really generalizable um, principles and strategies that can be part of your ongoing, uh, your ongoing efforts, um, and particularly as we are approaching, you know, spending and obligation deadlines for these funds. Um, these will hopefully spur some ideas about how you bridge the gap between this, you know, onslaught of COVID relief funding and, you know, the future um, once that funding is gone. So stop sharing. Um, Kylie, before you get out of this, yeah. uh, or no, it's okay. So uh, can you tell me what's been some feedback around who's used this tool and what have they used the tool for or what are they using the tool for? How helpful has it been? What kind of projects they've been using it for or information? Do you have any of that, that information? Absolutely, yeah. So part of the reason we created um, this tool originally was because we had uh, advocates and community leaders coming to us saying, I just need to understand that like there was so much funding coming from the American Rescue Plan. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water. Thanks. There was so much funding that came down in such a short period of time. There were advocates that, and even, I'm gonna say advocates, but also, you know, policymakers uh, at the local level who wanted to know what is coming down, how can I use this funding to you know, improve lives for the for the kids and the families in my community. What's allowed? What's not? Um, so that's why we created this because we realized there wasn't a place to see really the full outlay of all of the child and youth related funding and flexible funding um, that came down through the American Rescue Plan. So we have, you know, early on. This was used successfully um, to find information that was previously just kind of onerous to find. Um, so this brought brought it all together. Um, since we added um, the our examples section, um, I think that the use has changed a bit. Um, now we have. Uh, community leaders, primarily advocates, looking for, um, I want to say inspiration, but it's not inspiration. It's like proof that other people are doing this um, and they're doing, doing this well using funding. So it's been a real tool for um, like a proof point um, to decision makers that this can be done. Um, and I, I think ultimately, um, you know, one of the biggest lessons that we've learned over the past year and a half is that everyone is exhausted. And that includes our policymakers, our decision makers. And with this funding, so much of it was new. Um, like, and it came with so many regulations and reporting requirements and and a lot of public agencies, especially at the local level, didn't have the capacity to be, you know, super forward thinking. So I think we are grateful that community members, community leaders have been able to bring examples of, of solid plans. Uh, to their state and local policymakers, um, because what we've learned is advocates that can come to the table with a fully formed and informed plan, suggested plan, um, are a huge a huge help um, to decision makers, especially in times of crisis. So I would say. That has been the primary use. Um, and we are really thinking critically right now, um, in particular about you know, how we 
how we can help bridge the gap, this tool aside, um, between the COVID era um, and the future. And I think that is where um, Nat and Alicia's tools um, will be just huge assets um, as we have to think about how to sustain how in investment uh, during this era and how do we expand it in the future? Um, so I hope that answered your question. So let's bring on, let's keep that up and then let's bring on oh, Alicia. <laughs> Alicia, we're gonna bring you on. And uh, so I just wanna kind of circle it back around to the federal tool and this as a model and like kind of, can you say how that, that this federal tool might sort of look something like this or be kind of use this as a model for explaining the usability of the federal tool? Kylie, if you can bring that back up. Yeah. Yeah, so the federal tool will have uh, similar um, features in terms of being able to, to search and sort uh, by different uh, criteria. So if you think about those different columns in the, um, the Excel spreadsheet, all of those get converted into a way to search for uh, uh, and by different criteria. So for example, if you're interested in um, looking at um, early childhood programs, you'd be able to, in a very similar way, uh, kind of click through boxes and look through um, and just search by and get those particular early childhood programs um, uh, sorted. Um, if, and if you're interested in drilling down and understanding, okay, of those early childhood programs, what landed in a particular, um, um, uh, you know, uh, tribal uh, entity, you'd be able to also begin to not just kind of understand the big picture of a funding stream, but also to sort um, again, who, you know, um, how much on what. Uh, so think about those kind of three, uh, three things. Um, and very similar to here, when you click on a box, you would just get those things related to the criteria that you searched by um, that would pop up um, there. And you would see the things like the totals, numbers, uh, the amounts, um, uh, et cetera, change um, in real time related to your search criteria. Can we bring Jennifer in the conversation? Sorry, let me know if you when you want me to take this down, okay? <laughs> okay, let's let's keep it up. And okay. Jennifer, do you, do you have any does anything popping out to you as far as um what looks user friendly or like the information or any questions? Just as I as um as Kylie and the rest of the team was talking about it, I I think my mouth was hanging open most of the time going, "Oh my gosh, wow, this is so incredible." Because um, some of the questions that came out from the chat, even of, um, you know, what, how is this useful? And for me, it was really quickly. If I'm a tri if I'm a tribal program, I can click into some of. I, I think it was actually Alicia's tool um, that I can look in and see who my what, my what funding streams are my counterparts using and how are they using it. And so I can be, oh, I never thought of using, you know, like applying for the home visiting grant. Um, we just do it through our CCDF funding. So being able to sort of make these connections of what's out there um, versus what they're actually using. So that that was sort of my first thought of use of um, of use for an individual tribe. I was also looking at this from a use of from my from the national organizational perspective of particularly Kylie's um, presentation of how this funding is being used. Um, I did a quick search of, of tribes and CCDF since that's sort of the space that we're sitting in, and I, I didn't see any any examples. But the main screen of just tribes and the example that Kylie used, I think it was in a Alaska Native Village, but I don't remember which one. Um, and it said something around, you know, like improving the wages for their staff. Um, I just, I, without looking at it in depth, I just assumed that was for some kind of early care or education um, staff. But I saw that it, that did not come from CCDF. So I'm kind of looking at it from a perspective of people are investing 
and even outside of CCDF dollars and to be able to comprehensively explore what kind of resources put it, people are putting into their children. Um, I, I, Elizabeth um, in the chat kind of started hitting on this is an incredible opportunity for us to look at it um, kind of from an advocacy perspective, but also from a strategic um, comprehensive services perspective at the at a more localized level. Um, I'm just I, I'm just in awe right now and so excited about doing some looking in, at details. And we're really excited about the that concept that Kylie brought up. So starting with this this tool, using it for the American Rescue Plan dollars, and then bridging that gap between the future and planning for the future with with the federal funding tool that will be sort sort of similar to this, but having all that information ready, and then continuing to put programs that are successful in continuing to display that information so other people can get those inspirations and know where to kind of go and look for funding as well. And I think to add on to that, Sarai, oh, during COVID, we were reached out to over and over and over again from public funding agencies to say, how can we support tribes? And at that time, I said, Tri you know, tribes are looking for, they have this funding, but they actually don't have the staff in house to actually utilize the funding effectively. So what they need is capacity building support and um, help, you know, kind of putting the money into action. And they said, but the big challenge, so for organizations like ours who do capacity building, we're not the only ones certainly, um, but agencies who really help um, people who are used to running a $500,000 program who suddenly have two and a half million they have to spend um, and how you know how to deal with that in a program when when their program is structured around a five hundred dollar price tag every year, um, so they need that support. And what do they do? You know, what are the what is the first step they need to take? Um, and I, but I said that's what they need right now is this capacity building support, and the, you know the people and agencies and the funding of people to do that. But that's not to say that in two years, in three years, when this funding stream ends, now they have started these programs and built these, um, you know, services and and had F improved and, and created opportunities for children and families that then suddenly there's no money behind. So I said, so hold that thought for two to three years, because they're then going to need your, your money. <laughs> um, so I said, we have to start thinking about what this looks like. And this is just an amazing tool for us to be able to say, um, you know, my tribe's the Cherokee Nation. The Cherokee Nation has this much money that they're now spending on um, their children and families. But when this ends, you know, they're going to go from $260 million a year down to $60 million a year. And how do you, you've now ramped up, you've now increased services, you've now, you know, provided all this support to children and families. And in two years, you're going to say, sorry, that's not available anymore. Um, that's a lot of services that are going to be going by the wayside. Thank you for all that input. And thank you for your excitement at our tool. Good to hear. And I really, I can't wait for, I think Alicia was going to show us something. Yeah, to, to give people just one um, additional look um, at kind of what um, this could look like and interactive. I'm just pulling up um, a localized um, map that we did. This happened to be for the city of Oakland, just to give people again a look at um, kind of some of the interactivity we we're talking about. And again, to Jennifer's point, as uh, the federal uh, emergency funds dwindle down, um, again, to look at the, the steady state of the, the funding that will be available. So again, you'll see in kind of a spreadsheet form that you can scroll down quickly, um, a range of different funds. You can, again, in the ways that communities really think about what, what's happening for children, youth, and families, kind of really kind of click on it um, and then kind of get a different um, a different view just on a particular outcome, in this case, maybe um, educated. You could um, also, again, follow a particular um, stream. And again, um, we're going to have this map look very similar and really kind of, 
I drill down to very specific ways in which funding uh, funding um, flows into a given um, uh, outcome area, uh, a given set of services or programs that um, um, exist within a community, and even down to a particular program to, again, get various views of that. And to the COVID question again, um, you know, we are very much attuned to the fact that communities have a range of different, um, uh, lots of dollars that are flowing through. And in fact, some of the COVID dollars um, are definitely a sizable portion of this. So in this particular case, 12% um, of the dollars that are rolling through this particular community are you know, time limited and will go away. And so having conversations about what does it look like in a couple of years when those dollars aren't in play, um, um, is a useful uh, community-wide conversation to be having um, and to understand, again, impacts um, to particular uh, programmatic areas as well. So just wanted to share that really quickly to give people another way of thinking about kind of the visuals of an interactive uh, federal map. Yeah, so it's about a month out but just wanted to preview it for everybody and um, more than welcome to send us any feedback or any questions. We just wanna make sure that the final product that we come out with is very user-friendly, easy to use, easy to track stuff down, also available for questions, you know, once that tool does come live on our website. Um, so just preview and letting everyone know. Um, Back to this is uh, our, uh, I just want to remind everyone that we have the last webinar, we went over what cost models are and what they can be used for. We do have a pilot project that we're accepting applications for. We'd like love to work with the tribe and develop a cost model so that you can find out what the true cost to fully fund all your services for early childhood education, what that would look like. Um, and so that's what this cost model is. And those are those applications are due November 1st. And I think we'll put a link in the chat box. People can just go to that link. It's very a very low barrier application, just getting the basics. And uh, we'll be letting people know shortly after November 1st uh, if their project was selected. This is my contact information. If you have any questions about the pilot project or you have any questions about anything you've learned or seen here today and that you need to access, please feel free to contact me by email or phone. And now we'll go ahead and um, take questions. I see Jennifer also, but you put your contact information. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, well, we have two minutes left. I'm not, I don't think I'm, well, we got a new question. Okay. All right, so uh, with that, thank you everyone for coming, joining us today. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm looking forward to our next, uh, our next webinar, which will cover emerging funding strategies. Um, and like someone said in the chat, I think it was our CEO, Elizabeth Gaines said in the chat that, this, uh, that this next conversation that we'll be having about emerging funds really goes, blends nicely with the conversation we had today about what we're gonna do after the American Rescue Plan funds are depleted and what other opportunities are there to sustain those funds. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>